I don't know about you, but the Black Friday sales have already started and now I don't even know which Friday is Black Friday. But if you're looking for a very special gift for a friend, family member, or loved one, and you know that they might want to put wellness at the top of their list, then I'm going to suggest my wellness optimizing journal. This is a perfect companion to anybody who is wanting to optimize or better their own health and wellness. It's beautifully illustrated and it's got lots of guidance that you can customize for your particular needs or their particular needs. Maybe you even need to get yourself one. So the link to purchase is in the show notes. I promise you, it's a really special gift. Welcome to the Widely Optimized Wellness Podcast. I am your host, Terea Rodriguez, and I'm joined by the lovely co-host, Evie Tackett. Both of us are functional diagnostic nutrition practitioners, and we love working with women from all over the world through our virtual programs, helping women not only feel better, but actually achieve that vibrant, no holds barred version of themselves they've been missing for a long time. And how we actually get there Well, that is what this show is all about. Now, please keep in mind that this podcast is created for educational purposes only and should never be used as a replacement for medical diagnosis or treatment. And if you like what you hear today, we would love for you to hit that follow button, leave a review in Apple podcast, share with your friends and keep coming back for more. Let's start today's adventure, shall we? So welcome back, everybody. Uh, Today is probably going to be about one of my favorite topics of all time, and that is uh, chocolate. And we know that the holidays are here, or at least they're coming up at us very rapidly. And a lot of times chocolate is gifted as a gift, and we will reach for the sugar for various different reasons. And we also wanted to just kind of give you guys some deeper information in terms of why chocolate can be an absolute superfood and benefit your health and how can you choose better chocolate and not reach for uh, the big conglomerate Nestle's of the world. So yes, let's talk about some chocolate, shall we? Let's do it. I'm excited. When you brought up this topic, I was like, this is genius. Such good timing. Everyone likes chocolate or at least gifts it or, you know, has some story to it, especially this time of year. I have a whole new appreciation of chocolate after visiting you, um, which that was like mind blowing to learn all the things about it. So I'm excited that you get to now share this with the listeners. Yeah, this will be a lot of fun. Let's um tackle kind of the the health benefits, right? Because we know chocolate typically is prepared as a candy. And that's usually how people consume chocolate. And so because of the sugar, it can get demonized, I guess, in a way of like, hey, that's not really good for you. And it really, it's it's not the chocolate or the cacao. It's the sugar that's not really good for us. So, you know, in terms of eating chocolate on a regular basis, I typically don't recommend it unless you are eating something that is a much higher percentage of cacao. And thankfully... We're, we've gotten to a point in our marketing and packaging where you can see, for the most part, you can see the percentage of cacao. So that's that's a um, a takeaway right there. Is like if you are buying chocolate, make sure that there there's a printing of the percentage of cacao because at least that's one clue that you're getting better chocolate. Um, but there's other health benefits to chocolate, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The, the one that I always think about with myself and I'll talk to clients about is the magnesium content in cacao, right? So magnesium yeah. is a really important mineral that most people are not getting enough of. Um, it's Definitely rich not. in our soil. And because of the way agriculture has changed and how we're just like pushing food out so quickly and the soil health has changed and declined over the years, we're just not getting as much magnesium naturally through our food. And so you can boost that with supplements, which I do recommend and think can be great. I take myself, but you can also get it in what I think in what I call yummier ways, which is going to be through cacao. So that's right. 
cacao powder, I don't know, a big popular one that people have most likely seen is, uh, I think it's like like na- Nativas or Navitas or something like that. I forget the brand name, but it's a bag yeah. of it and you can buy it at most health food stores. And it'll say like there's three times more magnesium than whatever. Like cacao is really high in that. And so I always think of that of like, huh, I'm I'm loading up on some minerals that I'm deficient in. So I love it for that benefit. Um, and then I also want to share a little bit of how I use that later on for different parts of my cycle. But yeah, the first thing I think of too. immediately is uh, the magnesium, magnesium content. Yeah. 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 Which for for people who don't know, magnesium is really beneficial for multiple things. It's very calming to the central nervous system. It can help with GI issues. So if you're having, um, you know, maybe constipation or diarrhea or like a lot of gas or bloating or pain or cramping, magnesium can help. There's different forms of magnesium, which, you know, I tend to personally gravitate more towards glycinate. I know citrate can be very helpful for GI stuff, Um, but you're going to want to find the one that works better for you. But again, good for nervous system, bringing your body down, bringing yourself into parasympathetic, the cramping, the bloating, the stomach issues, bowel issues that can be beneficial. And then tied to that, I also look at that and the benefit of your hormonal cycle. So if you are experiencing PMS, Magnesium can be really beneficial, especially if it's like headaches or cramping or just kind of like uncomfortable abdomen pain. Magnesium is a great thing. And most women who are going to be going through PMS are already craving some sort of chocolate, right? And so that's, and is it really a surprise? Like if you think about it in that way, if your body is craving chocolate, you're really craving magnesium. And so it's like, let's give yourself more of that magnesium and you can do it in a yummy form of using cacao, you know, in the chocolate bar or doing cacao powder, which I actually make, I call it my period hot chocolate. So make a hot chocolate with cacao powder when I'm on my period. And that kind of is like serving the chocolate craving, but then also serving like PMS. Let's get this under control. Let's give my body what it needs. Yeah. I mean, cacao itself is called food of the gods. And there's a reason why, because there's a lot of different compounds and micronutrients that are in chocolate or cacao. Um, Chocolate technically is the term for the end product of what we've made with the cacao bean. Um, But there's lots of different uh, polyphenols in cacao. Mm -hmm. There's lots of different uh, minerals like magnesium, like what you were talking about. Um, And then there are other compounds. Some of them are stimulant-like compounds. Um, Most notably, it's the theobromine. So a lot of people will avoid chocolate because they uh, are afraid of the caffeine content. And I'm using finger quotes for those who can't see me right now. Um, There is some caffeine in chocolate, but the primary stimulant is a compound called theobromine. And theobromine is a vasodilator, so it can help with the headaches. That's what's really helping with any kind of headache. So oftentimes I will reach for a dark piece of chocolate when I feel a headache coming on and that will get me some magnesium and electrolytes because electrolytes are really key for headaches um, as well as it's that vasodilator. So this is why, um, what was the uh, -the over-the-counter migraine medicine with the caffeine, the major caffeine in it? Excedrin. Etc. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why, right? Is because caffeine and those kinds of stimulants are vasodilators, and that's why it had the caffeine in it. So anyway, um, cacao can be amazing for our health in that way. It's really the downsides are the sugar that it gets associated with, and almost always it's made into a sweet thing. Um, which cacao um, itself is not really sweet, right? Isn't it more bitter? It well, it de- <laughs> it kind of depends on what stage you're tasting it in, right? Um, and it also depends a lot. So cacao is very special in the sense that if you've ever gotten into craft coffee or wine or anything like that. Cacao is the same in terms of it's the flavor that comes from it. It's very influenced by the environment in which it's grown and handled. So it has a lot of that terroir. If we're going to steal a term from the wine industry, there's a lot of terroir in it. So some strains of chocolate can have more bitter notes to them just naturally. And some are going to be sweeter and you're going to get a lot of these different flavors. And I think 
The reason why, though, bitter comes to mind with 100% chocolate is because of the overall chocolate industry has kind of muddied the waters. We don't know where things are coming from. And so the big, bigger companies like the Nestle's and that kind of thing, they're buying cacao from a lot of different locations and then mixing them so that the the flavor is more consistent from batch to batch in these large scale productions. And therefore we're losing kind of track of where that stuff is coming from. And that flavor profile usually is fairly bitter at the straight up cacao bean. And so that's why as a confectioner, primarily Nestle is going to be a confectioner. They're just going to cut that with a bunch of sugar. Right. And so that's how it ends up being that way. So the byproducts of that industry are selling baking chocolate or cacao powder, which has all the bitter notes. So that's typically what people think of when we say like a hundred percent chocolate they're, they're thinking like baker's chocolate and it's bitter is all bitter and it tastes pretty nasty to be quite honest. Yeah. 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 Okay. But something that I've learned is um, this whole world of craft chocolate and craft chocolate has people in it that are skilled enough with flavors and, um, you know, just knowing the craft of like how to roast it and how to treat the beans in a way that you can literally have 100% chocolate and it tastes sweet and smooth. And it's amazing. It's a whole different experience. Um, that's what I, I, I brought some props. So yeah, yes. so 100% chocolate, right? And that's through craft chocolate, which is a whole different ball of wax than talking about the Halloween candy that's sold 50% off the next day after Halloween's yeah. over, right? Yeah. How did you yeah. get into craft coffee? Or craft chocolate. Craft <laughs> uh, coffee has its own story. Uh, that's yeah. <laughs> another podcast episode. Um, but craft chocolate. So, um, gosh, I'm trying to think of the time frame exactly when this was. This was right about the time that I was becoming an Afghan. So about 10 years ago, um, there, it, my husband and I would visit these different farmers markets, and we found a farmers market in Palo Alto, California, and. <clears throat> just adjacent to it was this little tiny hole in the wall called the chocolate garage. Literally, it was a garage converted um, by this wonderful woman. Her name is uh, Sunita Daytorell, and she runs the chocolate garage. And um, she really just, I mean, she's a biochemist at heart uh, and was working on brain science, actually. Um, but she really fell in love with the world of cacao and craft chocolate. And so she was sharing this information and trying to educate people on what what's the difference between craft chocolate and, you know, a larger name chocolate. And a lot of it had to do with just the industry as a um, commodity, right? Cacao is grown and then it's exported from these various different equ equatorial banned countries and um, a lot of times that leads to not paying people fair wages and leads to labor that includes actual slavery. And, you know, there's a lot of middlemen in the process. So the people actually doing the work of growing the cacao, they get removed from that whole process. You don't really know who they are. And then it gets all sent to this huge distribution center and then it gets sold as a commodity basically. And so there were all these different things within the cacao industry that she was trying to educate people on. But at the same time, there's a whole bunch of people that really love cacao for what it is and the different kinds of flavor profiles that you can get from it. And so they've fallen in love with it. And now they spend their time developing their skills and learning about the different uh, farmers and the regions and the environments in which these are grown to try and bring these flavors out as they work with the chocolate to make their their bars or make their confections or whatever it is. So I learned a lot of my knowledge from Sunita um, through the Chocolate Garage and eventually got to a place where I could volunteer for her and started teaching some of this myself. So that's kind of how I got into it. But I you know me. I'm a biochemist. I totally geek out on this stuff. And yeah. when I find something that I want to like go deep on, that's kind of what I do. So I spent a lot of time just learning the different makers and understanding different regions and 
different flavor profiles and and that kind of thing. And that's how I got into it. So yeah, now I spread that well, love with my friends. Yeah. Well, there's a lot more to it than I thought. Like when I came to visit you and you were like, we're going to do a chocolate tasting. I was like, oh, perfect. And then you bring out this like craft chocolate and I'm like, oh, this is serious. Like this is legit. And then you start talking to me about this this came from the same place or it came from different places, but processed the same or, you know, vice versa. And, and it was like, do you taste the difference here? And there's like a proper way to taste. And so I have this new appreciation now of cacao that again, I was just kind of thinking like it helps with period headaches. I like making hot chocolate with it, but now it's like really interesting because I've been looking at all these, yeah, chocolates at the store and I'm like, nope, don't see the percentage on that one. That's not quality or, you know what I mean? So it's really cool to think about it in that way. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, the, the one thing that I share with all my friends about trying to identify what's a craft maker versus a not craft maker. And it comes to down to a couple of things. Um, one is, I mean, the percentage point is helpful to understand how much sugar and extra additives are put into the final bar that you're about to eat. Um, but it doesn't really like just having a percentage doesn't say, ooh, craft maker, because I think even Hershey's now has percentages on their bars, right? So definitely not a craft maker. Um, but one thing that I really look for is I look for the ingredients themselves. And I want it to be just like anything else that we talk about with food, with our clients. We want to have it be the least processed version that we can. So if you see like cacao liquor and cacao powder and cacao butter as separate individual con components, we know that that came from a highly processed situation where they're, they're basically separating out the cacao powder from the cacao butter, which is the fat or the oil that comes off of it as it's ground down. And so now we don't really know where that's come from. So there's less of a transparency in terms of where it's come from. So I just look at the ingredients and that usually will tell me whether or not it's a craft maker. So if you're finding cocoa beans and sugar or cocoa beans and sugar and maybe a little cocoa butter added back in, then that is more of a craft maker style. And so the other thing that I tell people about is sometimes the makers will actually talk about where they're getting the beans from and maybe even who they're getting the beans from. So sometimes they will highlight which farm from Venezuela that they got the beans from, or sometimes they'll let you know that it's from a particular region that lets you know that this maker has established a relationship with those people to be able to get those beans, which is a whole different thing than just getting it from a commodity house. Um, so that's what I look for. Yeah. So simple. You said, you know, three main ingredients, right? Maybe it's like the um, cocoa beans, sugar, maybe cocoa butter added, but most of the time it's just like the cocoa beans and the um, sugar usually would be a good yeah, usually place to sugar. start. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at least, you know, because when I came back, I visited you in Bend, Oregon. And yeah. when I came back to Cincinnati, I, the first thing I did when I went to Whole Foods was like the chocolate aisle. And I was like, what do we have? And we didn't have a lot of craft chocolate there because I sent you a picture and it was a lot of like name brand stuff. And so that's, there's like a whole nother section that I didn't explore yet, which I guess I could. Um, but so that's thing too, is like, these things typically aren't going to be sold in regular stores or markets. Like they might be like the one-off thing that's there, but that is also the reality. So, um, Although I did find out because we looked into it, there is a craft chocolate maker in Cincinnati, which is really yes. cool. So I'm excited to check that out with you. To go visit yes. Them. Yep. That'll be really cool. But what is what are some resources that you would have or maybe names or brands that you could call out or kind of say, like, check this out. This is yeah. going to be great no matter what. Just so people who want to explore this know where to go. Yeah. Um, I, well, the first thing I would say is avoid getting your chocolate from the drugstore or from the major chain um, food stores like Safeway yeah. and Samco and, and those kinds of things, um, because you're not going to find craft makers there. There are some craft makers, such as Dick Taylor, for example. Dick Taylor is a craft maker that's located in Arcata, California. That's way northern coast California, 
really cool shop. If you guys ever make it through Arcata, California, go check them out. Um, really cool shop and really wonderful people, human beings. But Dick Taylor and his co their company, it's, it's uh, if I remember right, and you might need to fact check this, but I think it's two, two partners that have created Dick Taylor Chocolate. But they've worked really, really hard to be able to scale craft chocolate without ruining the quality or the um, transparency and where they get their beans, but to be able to scale it to show up in places like Whole Foods. So the fact that you can find Dick Taylor chocolate in Whole Foods is a big deal from like the craft chocolate world. Um, because oftentimes when people scale, they need venture capital funding or they need additional funding and then they end up getting bought out by big chocolate. And then, you know, the quality starts to go downhill from, from there. Um, so, you know, I would start to seek out where else can they find it? So it, it used to be that there wasn't really a online retailer of a lot of different craft chocolate. There actually is now there's one called uh, bar and cocoa and we'll put the link in the show notes Bar and Coco, they're on the East Coast somewhere, but almost every uh, maker that they put on there is a maker that I'm either familiar with or know their practices and, and know a lot about them. That's probably the first one that's made it available for a lot of people to be able to order the stuff online. But I would say, see if you can seek out these cute little shops in towns that are going to have craft chocolate and maybe something else. So for example, in <clears throat> Portland, Oregon, there's a place called The Meadow. And The Meadow has uh, all these different salts and chocolates. And that's their shop. And it's a super cute shop. And it's a lot of fun to go in. Because when you can go into a shop like that, that has a lot of craft makers, oftentimes, they will allow you to taste some of the chocolates that are there so that you can get a sense of what you like and what you don't like. You can talk to them about the different makers, that kind of thing. That's why I really like going into a local shop if you can find it. But you kind of have to seek out craft chocolate and something else maybe. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's it's not the easiest thing to find. It's not like you just have a bunch of craft chocolate companies hanging out. Yeah. Well, in how did you know? Because I told you, oh, there's this place in Cincinnati. I, I feel like they're probably craft chocolate. What? How did you know that based on their website? What are things that you can read? Like, is it going to say we are a craft chocolate company? Like, what are, is it where they source their beans from? Like, what are clues that someone could look for? Typically, they're going to be either telling stories about where they're getting their beans or highlighting farmers um, or, okay. you know, estates where they're getting their beans from. You'll see that on some of the websites. You'll also notice that there's an attention to detail in terms of their most craft makers that I've visited are very proud of their craft. It requires specialized equipment, specialized training. It takes a long time to really get all of the different steps because if we look at the steps of cacao from the the tree itself and the pod that grows on the tree to get into a bar, there's at least 15 or 16 steps. And I'm probably missing a, a couple steps in that wow. whole process. And so to be able to fine tune your craft and be able to, at the end of it, have something that tastes really good, right? Because it's really easy to kind of mess it up. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. really easy. There's so many different things going on. So a lot of times you'll see stories about the, the process and they're, they're proud of their process. You'll notice those things. So like dandelion chocolate, for example, is very proud of the process that they've been able to develop. And they too have started to expand and get a little bit bigger. And instead of going into Whole Foods, they're actually expanding their production locations. So now they've got San Francisco, California, and they have a couple locations in Japan. And so they're expanding into other countries and experimenting with different kinds of beans. Um, you will oftentimes see, so for example, this bar that I'm holding up is from a maker that is in Toronto, Canada. 
So a lot of times you're going to see makers that are going to be in lots of different places in the United States, worldwide, I should say. They're in a lot of different places worldwide that cacao is not actually grown. So that means that if cacao comes from equatorial regions on our planet, that cacao, they have to get it from somebody. So if they're definitely telling you where it's coming from, um, you could look for an origin on the packaging. And if it's telling you the origin, then that's another way that you can figure this out. Like uh, fruition, also East Coast, I think. Uh, New York, maybe. Okay. Yes, New York. Fruition is from New York. I love fruition because these guys have figured out the, they've cracked the code on 100% cacao that tastes really, really good. Okay. And this one right here has origin Dominican Republic and Peru. So they're blending two different types of beans together to get the flavor profile. Um, and the ingredients, organic cacao beans. The other uh, thing to look for is batch numbers because it's all going to be small batch stuff. This isn't going to be large scale production type stuff. Um, okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So I mean, aside from barn cacao um, and looking for local shops, those are the kinds of things that I look for when I'm looking at different bars. I check the ingredients. Do they have batches? Do they have origins? Um, are they talking about the farmers or where they're getting cacao? What are they doing with this whole craft chocolate thing? Mm -hmm. No, I love that. That's really helpful information and something useful that someone can like take away and actually look at, right? Because mm -hmm. I think that sometimes gets overwhelming of, okay, I know that this is probably better for me or better for, you know, people and, you know, economically or whatever, but I don't even know how to find it. So that's helpful yeah. to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, once you get into it, there's a lot of different things, you know, there's purist bars that are just going to be the cocoa beans and the sugar or cocoa beans and cocoa butter and sugar. Um, both Dick Taylor and Dandelion Chocolate are known for having really uh, smooth texture without using cocoa butter as an add-in. So that goes, that shines a light on their ability to do the production and like grind the cacao beans in a way to get that texture. So that's highlighting that they're not having to, well, cheat is a very hard word to use right, right yeah. here. Like it's a little bit too harsh, but they're not using the addition of cocoa butter to get that smooth mouthfeel. Um, and so those are like straight up bars. And then there's what's called inclusion bars. And that's going to be where you're adding things into the bar itself. So um, puffed rice or salt or nuts or fruit. Even, even some people will say cacao nibs, which is the crunched up version of the bean in a smaller uh, piece. Cacao nibs can be considered inclusion, even though it's still cacao. So that one's kind of on the fence, but those are inclusion bars. So that's when you're adding stuff into to get different flavors. Even vanilla being added in would be considered an inclusion. Um, and then there's confections. That's going to be the like truffles and the bonbons and the caramels and the candies. And those are going to be confections. So you can play around a lot with these different types of craft chocolate to see what you like. Um, and if you're trying to avoid sugar, then just look for the straight up bars that are higher percentage, 70% and higher is usually what I recommend for people. Okay. And if you're really focusing in on like blood sugar control, or um, perhaps you have diabetes and you need to really manage that, then I would say 80% or higher. And if you can develop a uh, palette for a hundred percent, then you're golden. Then there's no sugar in yeah. there at all. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Yeah. I love that. I would love to give the 100% a try. Yes. We didn't try it when you were there. We did try a hundred percent, but I would like, I want to actually buy it and have it at my house. I had a little bit that you had. I'm almost positive we had a hundred percent together. Yeah. Yeah. But I have not bought one and like tried to finish a bar. So I guess one of the easiest ways to enjoy chocolate is is doing exactly what you were talking about, Evie, is making your own chocolate drink by getting some cacao powder. How do you make your mm -hmm. your hot chocolate, your period hot chocolate? How do you make that? 
Yeah. So I heat up milk, whatever milk of choice, right? If you're having dairy milk, if you're having non-dairy milk, whatever it is, um, I'll heat up about a cup of that. It's really press personal preference of how much you want. Mm -hmm. And I'll heat it up over the stove top. Um, and then I will add in like one to two tablespoons of cacao powder. Okay. So again, this is cacao powder, not cocoa powder. There's a difference. There is. Um, so I'm doing cacao powder. And then I sometimes add like a scoop of collagen powder if I'm having that. Um, or just I leave it like that and I'll use a hand frother or you can put it in like a blender and blend it up nice and smooth. And then for sweetener, if you need something to cut that bitterness, because cacao powder can be very bitter for someone who's not used to that, um, I would recommend some sort of sweetener like a maple syrup or, um, you know, maybe even like some honey or something like Mm -hmm. that. Um, If you do stevia, you could do some of that. Um, I've gotten to the point where I don't need sweetener, which is pretty cool. Cause when I first tried it, I was like, Oh hell no, I need (laughs) sweetener in this. It was too bitter, but I've gotten much more, uh, I can take that bitterness now and I like it. Um, so I don't use sweetener, but I was using maple syrup when I was making it. So it's, it's very simple. And again, blend it up. It's nice and smooth and you can just sip on it and know that like you're getting that chocolate flavor, but you're also getting like a lot of the benefits of the cacao. Yeah. Yeah. And I know we talked with Willis on a previous podcast episode, and he's got his loving fungi um, drinking chocolate, which is Guatemalan cacao powder. And then he's put in some spices to it, some cinnamon and cardamom and that kind of thing, as well as the functional mushrooms. Um, I used to make a drink that I used to call bulletproof cacao. Um, This was back before uh, the Bulletproof company was like doing a bunch of cease and desist for using Bulletproof coffee in cafes. So I haven't actually talked about this in a long time, but very, very simple idea is, you know, taking the Bulletproof coffee concept and in a blender, I would place a couple tablespoons, maybe, maybe three tablespoons. So almost a quarter cup of cacao nibs themselves. And I would dump in some ghee and maybe some whey protein or collagen protein, some kind of protein powder. I would put in there unflavored protein powder. I would put that in there. And then I would put in hot water in the Vitamix and like blend that up to the point where you're grinding. You're literally grinding in the Vitamix, the cacao nibs into cacao powder. And then I would grind that up and drink that as my morning beverage for a long time. So that was something that I really enjoyed. Nice. I haven't thought about that in a while, so I might go back and do that now that it's winter is coming in and I need that nice, toasty, warm beverage to sip on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it's a nice alternative to coffee. It gets you, you know, if you're tired of coffee, your tea. And again, it's we use the term functional when we were talking to Willis, mm-hmm. but like it do, it is a functional drink in that way, right? Yeah. Like it's medicinal. Totally. Um, I mean, I know people that um, there is a. Um, health space, you know, in another city here in Ohio that um, the owner of that will hold cacao ceremonies like people like this becomes ceremonial for people. Absolutely. Um, So there's a lot of benefit to cacao, not just like physically, but also spiritually for some people. So um, I don't know much about it, but I do know that that exists. And so there's just so many really cool things that you can do with cacao. And so I feel like now learning more about craft cacao and craft chocolate that's like my next tier is um and so i'm ready to explore that yep, a little bit get more get into the ceremonial cacao i'm glad you brought that up because for a long time cacao has been a um it's been a very sacred food of lots of uh indigenous cultures and so like mm-hmm. peru and the aztecs aztecs aztecians aztecs uh aztecs you know, they use cacao in these various different ceremonies and rituals. And from what I understand, it is a um, very heart opening type experience to be able to have it, have the consumption of cacao be accompanied by these rituals. So um, definitely don't want to take away from that. So there is a little bit of that in like the craft chocolate world, like we're trying to find the balance so that we're not taking away from those indigenous cultures, the things that they rely on for their cultural needs. And at the same time, you know, educate people on choosing better chocolate because we all love it, but we don't need to like turn it into a commodity and have people be mistreated for it. So that's really kind of the, the take home message. So hopefully 
you guys have been inspired to continue your consumption of cacao just in a more healthy form and have a couple different options and ways to find stuff. And if you need help finding anything or you find something and you want us to do it like a double check, like, hey, Evie, Treya, what do you think about this? Just send us a snapshot. We'd be happy to give you some feedback. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Definitely. And hopefully you get to enjoy chocolate in a different way this holiday season. That's right. I know I definitely yeah. will. Awesome. Okay. We'll see you guys at the next episode. Hey, everybody. Terea here. If you like what you heard today, then I'm inviting you to become a premium member over at the Optimized Wellness Community because membership gets you instant and exclusive access to the full length versions of each of these conversations, both in video and audio format. Not only that, but with the community, you also get access to seminars, regular Q&As, activities, our seasonal challenges, and starting in December, your first month in the membership, you will get a copy of the Wellness Optimizing Journal. We also have a Luminary tier membership that gets you access to the live taught breathwork classes, as well as the visualization library and access to the coaches. Use the link in the show notes, become a member, and join us at the Optimized Wellness Community. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of the Wildly Optimized Wellness Podcast. If you are ready to dig deeper into your health, stop playing the wackest symptom game, start testing to get better guidance, you can find more about Terea at tereyarodriguez.com and you can find Evie at holisticallyrestored.com. Want to peek into what it's like to work with us? Come join us at our Optimized Wellness community. You can find the invitation link in the show notes below. And if you have a question for the show, you can submit your question under the podcast section of tereyarodriguez.com. Finally, if you found something helpful in this episode, don't forget to leave a review, hit that follow button, or share it with a friend. They're going to love that you thought of them. Until next time, see you outside.